three. Uh, it's hard to believe that my memory could be so vivid at that age. I always thought I was around four when my, uh, when my mother uh, took me to see uh, Fantasia and the experience that I describe in the book that I don't think I'm going to be reading that section. But it's kind of an interesting turn on the spiral that as I'm exploring the roots of uh, pop mythologies as religious experiences and religion as fake religion and the contradictions in our American culture where the fake reveals the authentic invisible cultural transformation and the authentic disguises the actual nature of the times we are in, uh, which is the paradox I play around with through the, through the book, which is, I guess, a kind of aletheia. But looking at that uh, and seeing the turn of the spiral that I'm working on Fantasia right at this time when I read the New York Times today and it says the videotape is out, and uh, if you rush only for 30 days, you can get the videotape of Fantasia. I'm also uh, thinking, as a cultural historian of uh, 20 years ago, with At the Edge of History, and this, in a way, is kind of like a turn of the spiral. It's a sort of mind travelogue about pop American culture, and it's a very extroverted meditation. But even before it uh, really came out, it already created a shitstorm in cyberspace, because friends were telling me that uh, there was just furious rage from Stuart Brand and Howard Rheingold about this book uh, because I'm not celebrating virtual reality. And, uh, and I thought it's kind of interesting because Stuart and I were, you know, we're friends and we're both, you know, fellows of the Lindisfarne Association. But there was a kind of little tempest in a teapot 20 years ago over at the edge of history when Stuart and I uh, were finalists for the National Book Award and I went to, went to Stuart and I think one can make a good case that the Whole Earth uh, catalog certainly was much more part of the architecture of pop culture than at the edge of history. But some of the New York culture types who were literary critics resigned from the, from the uh, board of judges in protest that literary prizes could go to a telephone directory. So it was really like a showdown between New York and California. And uh, I was in this funny position as a kid from California. I grew up in L.A. I went to L.A. High. I graduated from Pomona College. Here I was explaining California to New York in their terms, literary essays, and they were getting interested in it, but that was creating a protest and protecting the literary essay from the infiltrations of California. So I thought I was on, you know, Stewart's side. But then uh, when this turn of the spiral came up and I was taking another look at sort of a dark comedy of errors in the sun belt of Orlando and Atlanta and the Tucson biosphere and a little bit of the north of the West Edmonton Mall, the largest shopping mall in the world, which all, all of this is part of my anthropology for this book. It was intriguing that in the, the debate that I only heard about from, from friends, because I'm not privy and privileged to this particular electronic bulletin board. My uh, friend, the mathematician Ralph Abraham, said there are two cultures now. It's not C.P. Snow's two cultures, it's facts culture and modem culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely facts culture because it protects the integrity of the text. Oh. And literary writers and, and literary agents tend to use facts. And uh, scientists tend to use modem, partly because the university pays their phone bill. Um, <laughs> and as a, you know, since I'm not a professor, I don't have Ethernet to pick up the the bill or whatever bitnet, I guess it's called. So part of this um, the shitstorm that was going on in cyberspace, as Mary Catherine Bateson and Howard Rheingold and Stuart Brand and Francisco Varela in Paris. So this is like New Hampshire, Paris, California, are all arguing with one another. And somebody from Shell Oil, I guess, in the Shell Learning Group, who had made the mistake of saying, "Hey, I never read literary essays, but I've been reading this book, you know, and it's, it's literary essays, but it's kind of interesting." And then all of a sudden, California rises up in revolt and said, and Howard Rheingold was quoted on the thing saying, the literary essay is not the right form in which to discuss new technologies. So I thought, now that's, as a cultural historian, that's fascinating to me. Because here, 20 years ago, we were allowed to be sort of neck and neck for a literary prize. But now 20 years later, you're not even allowed to dare to permit yourself to think about the implications of the new technologies and only memoes in American slang and sort of uh, kind of apologetics that you see in Stewart's book on Inventing the Future at MIT, where he said, if you're not part of the steamroller, you're part of the road. Great line. <laughs> <laughs> Memorable prose. Uh, and the whole book is indeed a celebration of MIT with just like phallic fascination. Oh, you're so big, you fascinate me, you're wonderful. Uh, 
and not allowed to think about the shadow side of the medical uh, side of uh, to invoke Elul or Illich or Heidegger or anybody, just celebration of modernism and all its great rewards and joys. And every technology has to be, of course, revolutionary. You know, you can't have a new technology without it being revolutionary. So it's kind of fascinating to me to see uh, how we play this kind of bicoastal ping pong that I was an MIT professor writing about California. And then Stuart Brand, you know, Silicon Valley goes and writes about MIT and we go back and forth. And yet the more we engage the culture, the more we enter into this catastrophe bifurcation where our sensibilities split. I wish Stuart were here tonight. Uh, but uh, so even in the very process of doing it, it sort of engages itself in the culture and generates anger, rage. And you always know something's good and something's real when people are getting angry. It's connected to guts and life and nerves and blood and everything else. So part of it um, is, I think, how I say it is as important as what I say. And part of this is an attempt to protect the integrity of the literary essay. All of the chapters of the book are named after the functions of the video recorder. So it's fast forward with a jeu de mots of both meanings of the word fast forward, play and record and erase. And it's an attempt on the part of the writer to return the favor. Electronics surrounded us and made us an artifact in their post whatever culture. And I'm trying to return the favor. And yet the very uh, effort to say the literary imagination is adequate and appropriate to discuss the implications of technology, there's a sense that this is a threat and that this is, uh, this is not uh, the appropriate way. And the, the dictum coming out of uh, Howard Rheingold, who is now the editor of the Whole Earth Review, is to say literature just has to disappear from the face of the earth, that only memoese is the appropriate language for the imagination now. And I think that's really quite intriguing. And um, I'm Irish enough to say, fuck you, buddy. Uh, I'm not about to do it. But the, I wish to mythologize the fight and not to have it disappear in cyberspace, because I think it's so, it's so important and so interesting. And to argue in favor of Howard Reinhold's book on virtual reality, he went ironically to a lot of effort to be a cultural historian and to really research the roots of entertainment and Silicon Valley and all the, all the origins of, uh, of virtual reality and how it came to be. Um, that said, I think what I'll do, uh, oh yeah, what I want to say also with this in terms of the turn of the spiral is, uh, as I was uh, coming up here, people saying, well, with nonfiction writers, it's, uh, you know, it's a little different from fiction writers. And I was thinking, well, fiction, nonfiction, you know, this doesn't work anymore. And part of my whole career has been to try to create a kind of new genre of Wissenskunst where the, the actual uh, art of nonfiction, which is not alone to me, people, you know, Norman Mailer, Lewis Thomas, Castaneda, others have used this. But in this particular book, I'm also trying to blur the distinction between fiction and nonfiction because it is a travelogue on the real, but the last uh, conclusion of the book is actually a short story. So it, and it's a short story that doesn't occur in real time. It all occurs in video monitors. So in that sense, I'm moving into uh, agreeing with Stuart Brand and Howard Rheingold and going from reality to cyberspace. I thought what I'd do tonight is just, uh, I was going to read the fast forward, but I think that's so snarky and so swifty and that you might think I'm very anti-American and then I'd have to you know, fight patriotism and, hey, you're just a Europhile putting down America, and that's not what I'm doing in the book. Uh, I thought I would go, since this is the 50th anniversary of the Disney stuff, I read a little section of the, uh, the Disney chapter. It's hard because it's a long chapter. It's like 55 pages on the cultural implications of Disneyism. And I'm only going to read about 10 or 13. And that should take about 20, 25 minutes. And then the rest is open for questions or refutations or heresy trials or anything you want to do with me. <laughs> is that okay? Okay, this is from the chapter called Play. Uh, well, let me read you the title so you can get the structure of the book. 